Hi there. For those new to this channel, welcome. My name is Aditya Chain. I'm an MD student at Harvard Medical School with a bachelor's in biomedical engineering. I'm starting a new video series where I talk about my thoughts on articles, research, and just topics that I find interesting. I talk a lot about medicine, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and occasionally science fiction. So let's dive right in. In the first episode of this new series, I'm going to be talking about a research article I found really interesting. It was published in Nature, titled Health System Scale Language Models Are All-Purpose Prediction Engines. In this video, I'm going to walk us through this paper and why I find it so interesting. So let's get started. This paper was published very recently, in June of 2023. And as we go through the introduction, they essentially talk about how there's a, a sort of problem in medicine where physicians have to make a lot of decisions. And um, these decisions are really complex. They require a lot of different data. Um, they use uh, unstructured and structured data models, meaning that um, the decisions that they're making are sometimes based off of qualitative information as opposed to quantitative information. And there's a potential here for computer tools to perhaps aid physicians and um, be involved in this complex decision processing. So they kind of established that in this paper, uh, they're going to be training a large language model called NYUtron and fine tuning it uh, to test if it can serve as a clinical decision maker um, in the medical process. So now critically, they tested on five tasks. Uh, one is all-cause readmission prediction. The second is in-hospital mortality prediction. The third is comorbidity index prediction, length of stay prediction, and insurance denial prediction. So for those of you without a background in medicine, these are um, questions that are really important to the way that a hospital is run. Uh, for example, if we can predict which patients are going to need to come back to the hospital, aka readmitted, we can take interventions beforehand to try and prevent that from happening because it costs both the patient and the system a lot of money to uh, have these patients come back. And research has shown that it often leads to worse outcomes for these patients. Um, so we want to intervene early on. They also talk about um, predicting the severity of disease. That's what their comorbid comorbidity index prediction. So disease severity, can we predict how severe someone's disease is using this data? And then they also talk about insurance denial, which is important if you're running a hospital. So in the abstract, they basically conclude with showing that they believe that they've succeeded at this goal um, and have an AUC for these different tasks uh, between 78.7 and 94.9%, and it's an improvement over the traditional existing models already used in healthcare. And finally, they believe that this sort of system uh, can be generalizable um, for uh, medical purposes and other sort of predictive tasks. So we're going to sort of breeze through the introduction of the paper. Um, essentially goes over uh, the, the problem again. It establishes that um, there's something called an EHR, which is the electronic health record. And different hospitals have different electronic health record systems. It's the way that they hold all of the patient data. Now, this is a huge problem for researchers in the space and even for clinicians, because it makes transferring data between hospitals very challenging. However, because this was done by NYU, they're such a large hospital system that they could have all their data in one place and still have enough data to train such a large language model. Then they talk a little bit about uh, the history of different approaches on this task. So they talk about encoder models such as BERT and decoder models such as GPT-3. Um, and these are, you know, sort of... Um, different approaches that both target the same issue of language prediction. In decoder models like GPT-3, um, the goal is to essentially uh, be able to predict the next word in the task, while encoder models take your words as input and they condense it down into some type of uh, machine encoding. So you can think of it as um, almost being linked to each other, where BERT type models, they take your words like the person, 
and they encode it down into some type of complex machine data, you know, with all these numbers, and then you can use these as features for predicting a task. Versus GPT-3 takes your data as an input, like so, and it tries to decode it and predict the next word in the sequence. Now, this has also evolved where, um, and they, they talk about this a little bit in their paper, is that as opposed to just predicting the next word, there's a new approach called mass language modeling. So I'll zoom in on their figure here. And mass language modeling has been really successful for training large language models, where you take a phrase and you randomly mask certain words in the phrase during the training uh, of the machine. And so uh, the machine has to basically predict what is the word hidden behind this mask and use that to improve its accuracy. So now let's uh, walk through a little bit uh, about their methodology here. And um, they basically state that the NYU hospital is very diverse. It has four urban hospitals and 350 outpatient sites. This is very important for medical tasks because, um, you know, we often have to ensure that our results are generalizable to the different types of hospital systems around the country. Um, and then finally, they uh, start to talk about um, this approach in general. So I think this figure that they made is really good to get an understanding of their overall approach. So we're going to start here with part A, data collection. Um, and this essentially says that they took all of the electronic health record data and turned it into these clinical notes as an unstructured data format. Um, these are essentially the raw notes that the physicians write. Then they took that and they added in these task-specific labels. So for those five goals we talked about earlier, um, what was the expected outcome or the ground truth? So for example, for this set of notes, let's say it's a patient um, with congestive heart failure, did that person end up having a readmission? Maybe that would be labeled as one versus zero if they didn't. Next, they pre-trained their language model just using the notes. And they did that with the mass language modeling task that we talked about. So um, you, if you take an architecture like uh, GPT-3 or um, an existing one, uh, and we'll look and see what exactly they did, uh, but you can then sort of pre-train it on your data set um, so that way it can understand the language of that task. Then once they had this model, which now, uh, to reiterate, is just able to sort of process medical language, they had to fine-tune it on these specific tasks. So let's say for readmission, the model predicts that there's a 60% chance that this person is getting readmitted, but there is actually a 40% chance or whatever their outcome is, then we use that to update our model and fine tune it. And then finally, they just talk about how this can be deployed, um, where as you know, the physician is uploading notes, maybe the AI is working in the background, and then they get an email saying that, oh, you know, this patient may be at risk for readmission, uh, let's, let's take some interventions uh, immediately. So let's talk a little bit about the um, AI approach that they used for this paper. Um, so they talk about first the, uh, the amount of data that you need. So if anyone, if you have experience with large language modeling, uh, you need a lot of data. So they used 7 million clinical notes um, from 387,000 patients and ended up having a 4 billion word corpus. Um, and that was across 10 years worth of data. Uh, and then they used the BERT model with a mass language modeling objective on the data set. So this is different from the GPT model um, where we're essentially now taking our input words, masking one of them, and asking the model to predict what is the masked word based on how it compresses the data. And then finally, they uh, tested it in a 30-day um, readmission prediction in a real-world environment and assessed the impact. Now, because I've already read this paper, uh, this was not done um, sort of prospectively on new data. They used old data, but data that the machine hadn't been trained on and um, had it look at the task prospectively as the data was coming in, although it was old data. So now they talk about their performance. And I'm going to skip past some of these numbers. We can look at the uh, pretty figures. Um, 
But you can sort of see here that for these different tasks, uh, they kind of summarized as we talked about what was their success rates. So um, in predicting in-hospital mortality using the clinical notes data, they had a 95% uh, AUC or 0 0.95, I should say. I'm not sure what exactly their baseline is, so we're going to take a look at that too. But you can see that for readmission, this is a harder task, and they had an AUC of 0 0.8. Um, and then for this co comorbidity prediction, one thing that I noticed here was that um, if you look at their predicted uh, comorbidity versus the true one, so for example, if the true was three to four, the machine is predicting one to two in 44% of those cases. It's a little concerning. It suggests that the machine is perhaps underestimating risk for patients. And you can see that's kind of a consistent pattern where machine predicted zero, but it was truly one to two. Machine predicted one to two is really three to four and so on. Um, so, you know, maybe some calibration could have been done or further fine tuning here. Now let's look at these two other tasks, insurance denial, you know, 88% approximately, and uh, length of stay, they had 0 0.8. So interestingly, the length of stay and readmission tasks um, were the ones where the machine struggled the most. Uh, I find that a little bit surprising because I would think that in-hospital mortality is very linked to the length of stay. Um, but, you know, there are other factors which affect the length of stay that come down to patient preferences, things that even physicians, you know, you can't predict uh, that happen, patients, family members, and things like that. So understandable. Um, Let's look and see if we can find where they talk about their baseline. Okay, so here they mention it. They used an available subset of claim form features, such as age and insurance providers. So they reference this um, 19, so keep that in mind. We'll, we'll try to look at back at that later. Um, and they also mentioned this Lisbon, Portugal features uh, as another set. So, you know, these are likely to be, um, you know, kind of standard techniques for uh, predicting insurance denial and things as, you know, this is obviously an established field. So, um, they said that they looked further at the 30-day readmission analysis. Um, and they did retrospective and prospective setting analysis. So they actually compared it to humans as well with six attending physicians to see how their predictions of readmission for 20 cases sampled from a random split compared to NYUtron. So I found this data really interesting. So let's take a look at that. So if we zoom in here on the AUC curve, um, you can see the, the orange line is the NYUtron's AUC. And this circles are the physicians. So it's not a smooth line because they only tested the physicians on you know, 20 data points versus the uh, NYUtron had a lot more. But you can kind of, you know, if I, if I were to graph this out, I could put a line through it like something like this, or, you know, that's a little, little over generous, maybe something like this. So you can see that, you know, at these points that they measured, uh, there was, the, the physicians were not performing as well. But there were instances, some cases where the physicians outperformed the model. So it's a little bit unclear, but you know, based on this data, I would suspect that you could say that the NYU Tron um, was maybe better at predicting readmission than physicians, but probably more data is needed to make that conclusion. Um, and then they kind of this this just talks about like how there was some scaling properties. If you know me, you know I love AI scaling, uh, and they kind of also found that performance improved with um, with scaling, and they say that their model is, you know, perhaps making better use of the data than some existing models, suggesting that they learned this language task well. Not surprising, considering that they trained the model on their NYU data, and then they're testing it on NYU data, versus these ones are probably trained on you know, as you can see, Wikipedia data or uh, web data. And then they also compared it at different sites. Um, so Manhattan, if they fine-tuned it on Manhattan, they had an 82% AUC versus if they fine-tuned uh, the model on, um, on Manhattan but pre-trained it at Brooklyn, uh, 
uh, it had 81, 80.91%. So these kind of are pretty robust, showing that, you know, the model isn't like overfitting to one specific location, and it's pretty generalizable across locations. So let's continue through here. It's so again looking, you know, at more of their data. Um, and then they start talking a little bit about the impact. So they talk about this perspective study of their predictive performance. And um, they talk about how uh, they looked at 100 readmission cases, and 61% of those that were successfully predicted by the NYUtron were actually unplanned. 50% would have resulted in a penalty according to the CMS guidelines, meaning that the hospital would have lost some money, and 27% were preventable according to the consensus point of these six physician panel that they created. So this is like, you know, a key impact of this tool that they're talking about, where there's some preventable in readmissions, you know, 27% that perhaps could have been identified and steps could have been taken um, to prevent it. That's kind of the story that they're telling us here. Uh, and then they also are saying that some of these readmissions, you know, maybe they weren't preventable, but uh, just by predicting that they were going to happen, the hospital could make better financial decisions and, um, you know, predict their costs. So that's pretty much a quick look at this paper. Um, let's go briefly into their discussion. Uh, you know, one of the things that they kind of talked about here, which I found interesting, was they say they use a smaller, less than 1 billion parameter model um, trained on highly tra tailored data versus nowadays most people work on kind of foundation models, as it's called, where you train a really big model and you fine tune it for a specific task. They say that, uh, you know, this was pretty successful for them. Um, and, you know, they, they, they think that this is, could be a good step. But, you know, there's pretty consistent research, in my opinion, which uh, shows that eventually the general model outperforms the specific model, even on the fine tuning task. Yes, it's harder to create these foundation models. You need a lot of data. And obviously, it was not something that one institution could probably do. But um, in the long run, I really hope that there is, you know, some sort of collaboration between institutions uh, that would allow us to create such foundation models. They also talk a little bit about the compute that was required. Um, you know, 24 NVIDIA A100 GPUs with 40 gigabytes of VRAM, and then fine tuning use eight A100 GPUs. This is, you know, pretty good um, compute. Um, you know, I've definitely seen more in some papers, but uh, this is pretty bog standard for what I've seen as, uh, you know, the capabilities of the high performance clusters at top institutions. So um, very interesting stuff. And they also mentioned this point that I was talking about, about how uh, in-domain clinical text versus out-of-domain text and out-of-domain models can eventually be uh, fine-tuned and perhaps do better. And eventually, they want to do you know randomized controlled trials, um, and they're working on it within their own health system. So that's really interesting. So AI assistants observing care along with them, chiming in with predictions and advice. That's their vision for the future. I think it's a really, really exciting uh, vision as a medical student uh, eventually coming into the, the world of medicine. And I suspect that many tasks in the future will have AI taking parts of it um, in medicine or uh, you know, even acting as safety rails. Because you have to remember that physicians are people. And like everyone else, people can make mistakes. Um, but people also have their upsides where you know perhaps they can understand where a person is coming from and uh, disagree with the AI for specific reasons. But we have to be careful as bias can also be one of those reasons. And that's not why we would want someone to take a, a different stab. So I think this is going to be a really complex world coming up when sort of figuring out what's the role of these models, um, how much should be left to humans. And that's where scientific research can come in and really give us the randomized trials that, that help to answer these questions. So, um, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about their methodology. You know, we already talked a little bit about the scale. The rest of it was pretty standard, you know, their ratios of training uh, versus testing data um, and how they collected this different data. You know, most 
interestingly, in my opinion, or not that interesting, but, uh, you know, they basically said that, like, we can't share this data because it's NYU's, um, and they an anonymized it for this task. Um, but that's all pretty bog standard. Um, the baseline algorithms they talked about, uh, they used three attending physicians and three residents in their comparison, which is interesting. Um, they compared it against BERT, WebWiki, WebWiki Bio. So these are different BERT models trained on different data sets. And um, then for their 20 discharge note test, they asked the physicians basically via a red cap survey, also very standard. Um, and yeah, it was ethically approved and no data availability, but they will, uh, may obtain a limited set on request, um, you know, subject to national ethical approvals if somebody needs to test this or, or take a closer look. But yeah, this, so this paper, um, was published in Nature, and um, I think it's really exciting. It's a real um, example of how AI can impact the field. Now, of course, this video series is about my thoughts. So in addition to talking about the paper, I kind of wanted to talk about, um, you know, what what's, what's my thoughts about where this can go next, and what are the limitations as well as um, perhaps um, successes of this uh, this paper. I really like their title, first of all all-purpose prediction engines. I think that this is a great way to think about large language models. Uh, people have sort of, I think, too narrowly focused on their application just in text, but transformers have been shown to um, be essentially sequence predictors. They work for, you know, predicting movement in robotic arm tasks. They work for predicting video game action, uh, even, you know, competing with reinforcement learning models at, at some scale. And I think that um, there's a lot of opportunity here to make uh, even larger um, prediction engines. And something that I'm really excited about is actually creating a foundation model in medicine for this task. Um, you know, when I first read this paper, I was excited but also a little disappointed because I'd had a very similar idea uh, that I'd wanted to work on. And, you know, they kind of scooped me. But um, something that I've been thinking about that I think could be a really interesting avenue of exploration uh, in this in this field is um, how we encode the data itself. In this paper, they used this um, approach where they basically took the clinical notes and uh, treated it like a language task, you know, and essentially that leverages the sort of power of existing models like BERT and GPT and likely reduced their, you know, computational bandwidth and the amount of pre-processing that they'd have to do. But I think a really interesting step forward would be, what if we take all the data that's available? And here's how I would think about it. Let me uh, switch over my screen. Uh, getting my doodle tool set up here. So as a... Uh, as a medical student, you know, we have the opportunity to um, be a part of the medical process and, and really, you know, even affect patient care. Um, and so from my learnings from that, uh, and the way that residents and attendings have taught me about how to look at a patient, what are the first things that we do when a new patient comes into our inpatient medicine team? Well, you know, first we check their vitals. You know, we have to make sure they're stable or not. Um, and if we think that they're stable, if we think that they're not stable as a medical student, our job is just to report immediately, you know, somebody with more experience needs to take a look at this and, and figure out what to do. But let's say they are stable. What do we do next? Well, the approach that I found really helpful is you take a look at it chronologically. So we look at their, um, their records and usually it starts with something like patient appeared to the ED, ED doctor thought this ordered XYZ tests, you know, they got an x-ray added in, they got like some uh, uh, basic metabolic panel, whatever, uh, and then they made the determination they need to come to inpatient medicine. So, you know, this is brought, sort of simplified. There's often a lot of things that happen in between here. There are nurses notes that get put in. Um, there's uh, other practitioners involved. There's, you know, the x-ray interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of what happens in a hospital visit. Now, on top of this, 
physicians also have to look at the patient's sort of past data. So um, let's see, how do I do this here? Nope, that is not what I want. Um, anyway, I'll just... So, do, 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 do. Let's just create a new drawing here. Okay, so um, in addition to this data, so I'll, I'll label this as a sort of admission data. On top of that, physicians also have to look at their history. So we look at their past medical history, we look at the summary, uh, but we also sometimes need to look at specific results from the past, like their x-rays in the past, or, you know, their past visits to the hospital, what caused them, what problems does this patient already have, how could that be impacting their current disease. And these data sort of gets collated together in the final note that the patient, that the physician writes about the patient that they're using in this data. And that note, you know, typically takes some sort of format um, where we describe, uh, you know, the, the, who's the patient, why did they come in, um, this is called the chief concern or CC. Uh, and then, you know, what are the problems here? And what's our plan for addressing them? And finally, like a summary of, uh, you know, what, what do we think is the next steps and what's the most critical for the next team that's taking care of this patient? So, you know, physicians do this as humans kind of integrating all this data. And that's kind of what they use uh, in this in this paper. Let's just like cut to the chase and and use the already fixed data from physicians. But what I wonder about is if we can create a foundational model which actually uses the data itself. And the way I think about it is that let's think of each time a patient has an interaction with the medical system as an encounter. So across someone's life, and you know, if you if your hospital uses a system like Epic which we use um, at Mass General and Brigham and Women's, um, you can actually see this view uh, as, a, as, a, as a student or you know, as a physician, and I find it particularly helpful. So each person's life is sort of a series of encounters with the medical system. And if that person is lucky enough to have had one hospital system their entire life, we even sometimes have their birth um, you know, records. What were the problems they had as a baby, if, if any? And what I wonder is that if you look at it in this way, it's almost like a chronological task where one encounter leads to the other. Of course, there are incidents that happen in between, but each encounter in some way is related to the next. And if you think of each encounter as a token of some sort, well, then this becomes a simple uh, large language model type task that LLMs are, are perfect at, uh, to use for predicting the next token. You can even use a similar approach where you mask out a, one encounter and you ask the machine to predict this encounter. Now the tricky part comes, how do we compress the data of one encounter into a token? Um, and you know, of course, the issue on top of that is not every encounter is the same. Somebody's notes or data from a hospital visit is very different from their PCP. So I think this is where the difficulty of this approach would happen. Um, but it's also where, uh, you know, I, I have some ideas for solutions. I think you can encompass data into a few different types. There's sort of quantitative data. This is like their labs. And then there's interpretive data. This is what I would say is like your x-ray report. Um, in the quantitative data, you'd also have like the x-ray image. And I think some of this quantitative data is easy to compress. Labs, for example, it's often literally one value, like 0 0.4 or, you know, sodium of 137. And x-rays, though, or things like that, you know, there are whole models dedicated just to understanding an x-ray. And I think that could be probably outside of the scope of a foundational model task. But one thing you can do is take the x-ray interpretation. So the x-rays are read by some radiologist who then gives their impression about what's going on in this image. And that is, you know, just natural language. So you can process this with, you know, NYU Tron or, or any of the existing 
um, language models, or you could fine tune one on your data. So now these are almost like different subtypes of tokens. You have a data type token. So you know you can imagine it as um, your when you're training your machine. Um, let me go home here. Actually, let's start a new start a new window. So when you're training your machine, um, you have some type of data token coming in, and then that will be followed by a um, interpretation token, followed by a um, you know maybe some other type of token that could be relevant, uh, like. Mm, we could say there's some imaging token or something like that. But you can basically sub your, divide your data uh, into different tasks like this. And then how do you create these tokens? Well, we have a tool for that. It's called autoencoders. Autoencoders are a really great way to compress data of sort of complex structural um, significance. So I think you know our text data can probably go raw, uh, but it you know of course depends on the size of our model and um, how complicated we could make it. But the approach I would probably take in a first test of this is I would take our text data or our interpretive data and pass it through an existing LLM like BERT, for example, and have it reduce that to some encodings. Uh, this is essentially like a latent space type representation of our data. Now, our imaging data, I would probably ignore in this because we already kind of get that with our interpretation and I think it's too complicated but you know perhaps some future researcher could incorporate that and then our lab data what I would do is use an autoencoder to compress it down and, and reproduce it even for the natural language task you could take this and create an autoencoder for that as well so now we have these and I'm just going to pick a random number here let's say 64 um integer 64 by one representation of each of these data types so you know that sounds kind of weird so like how do we think about that well let's say you know you have to categorize all of the different types of encounters that happen in the hospital system into uh, instead of 64 let's say three types well you know naively as a human i may look at it and say okay you know there's one type which is like emergencies you know ed visits one type which is like inpatient stuff and one type, which is outpatient stuff. Now you could pass this to an LLM, and you know, I think you can kind of see where we're going here. Where let's say there's a patient who, um, uh, who their data stream, you know, their tokens looks like this: ED, 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 right? Now your model has to predict what the next one is going to be. What's the next token? I mean, there's a good chance it's it's an ED, right? Of course, this is extremely simplified because you're only really looking at three things. But if we can add granularity to this, where you know between ED visits, perhaps there's you know these subtypes, and these subtypes would be very difficult for us as humans to figure out. But AI on millions of data sets can figure out these subtypes, and we then encode them as tokens, and incorporate both the the visit data with our actual lab data, and I think. What can happen here is you'll have a tool that allows us to model or predict a patient's hospital life course. And I think the potential for that is, is really exciting. You could use it for these same tasks, you know, predicting readmission. You essentially give the model your chain of tokens of the patient's history and say, okay, you know, what's the probability that they're going to need to come back to the hospital in the next 30 days? But you could also use it for really interesting tasks where we model, um, you know, what are the potential trajectories that a person may have in the future by having our large language model sort of predict the next word, um, you could say, uh, of their of their medical encounters. And based on that, that could allow us to do really important planning for, let's say, insurance claims or even as a hospital, as a physician. And in a way, you can almost think of it as being a physician, because if you can predict that this person who, let's say, had a surgery um, for cholecystitis, if the AI is predicting that their next event 
for whatever reason, is most likely another surgery, then perhaps there's something about this surgery that is telling us that something went wrong or this patient is at high risk. And that's the job of a physician. So I think that this sort of foundation model would be really powerful. It's really challenging to build, would require a lot of compute, but that's what I'm really excited about. And I think this paper was a first step towards um, creating that model. And it sort of highlighted to people in medicine that this is the power of AI, because you know I think finally now people have started to realize that in medicine, but there's still a lot of skepticism and there's still a lot of real world application missing. So I think that, um, you know, congratulations to these authors at NYU, and uh, it's really a nature-worthy uh, level of work, and I'm excited to see where this goes in the future. All right, that's it for this uh, first episode. Uh, thank you for watching if you made it all the way through. Um, let me know in the comments what sort of topics you'd like to see me cover in the future. Are there papers you'd like me to read or um, news articles that you'd like my thoughts on or an explanation of? Uh, I'll be sure to take that into consideration. Hopefully, um, you'll see me soon. Thanks.